Thank you very much. The next item of business is a member's question time session on local government and communities. This follows the format that previously has been done only in virtual sessions. So if members wish a supplementary to your own question, uh, please press your request to uh, speak button or the uh, online equivalent. Uh, any additional request to speak will be taken if time permits uh, at the end of the session. Uh, and of course, as, as ever, uh, we would appreciate short and succinct questions and answers. Can I start with uh, question number one from Bruce Crawford? Uh, thank you, President Officer. As a result of the COVID-19, has the Scottish Government been able to quantify in its discussions with local government the shortfall in income that councils have suffered as a loss of revenue because of facility closures or reduction in fees and charges, etc.? And is the Cabinet Secretary aware that cause the leaders have agreed to work on a joint letter to the Chancellor about the impact of the loss of this income and what actions can the Scottish Government take to support local government leaders in their approach to the UK Government? Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Um, Ministers uh, are in regular and open dialogue with uh, COSLA over a range of cost pressures that local government are facing as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, including the impact of loss of income. Uh, officials have now received COSLA's analysis of the initial additional expenditure and loss of income figures for the period March to end June 20. 2020, in which they've estimated uh, the, the, the losses of income to the authorities. And we'll continue to engage with the UK Government about the funding implications of COVID-19, including the impact on local government, including uh, the work that my uh, colleague Kate Forbes continues to take forward in terms of engaging with the UK Government, uh, particularly around uh, the financial implications of COVID, not just to the Scottish Government, but also the impact that that will have on local government more generally. And we'll continue to keep members updated as how those discussions progress. But I think everyone is under no illusions that this has been a challenge, not just for us, but for local government as well. Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Novice, and thank you, the Cabinet Secretary, for that answer. Do you agree, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that these discussions with the Treasury are very important because of the very limited level of fiscal powers available to devolve governments in these situations, and that borrowing for, for this situation can only happen under the fiscal framework if it's a, if it's a UK-wide specific shock by the UK government, but the Scottish government cannot borrow if it's a in these circumstances to support this sort of activity? Cabinet Secretary. Ab absolutely. I think, you know, everyone is under no illusion that this is an unprecedented situation that we find ourselves in, both ourselves, both the UK government. And does that then beg the question then, are the current fiscal arrangements suitable to respond to that uh, unprecedented nature of a pandemic? Now, I think we want to ensure that we continue to engage constructively with the UK government. The First Minister outlined how that uh, constructive engagement with the UK has been so critical in enabling us to hopefully try and emerge through the current restrictions. But that will have to then uh, take forward uh, discussions around whether or not the fiscal arrangements at the moment are appropriate for us to fully uh, ensure that we can protect uh, jobs, that we can protect our public services, and we don't revert back to the austerity that had happened as a result of the financial crisis back uh, in 2007-08. So absolutely, we'll continue to uh, engage robustly, but constructively with the UK government. But it does, I think, highlight that the, the shortfalls of the current fiscal arrangements in order for us to adequately ensure that we can support people and our economy and our communities as best as we can going forward. And that will obviously have to mean that we look and ask and request for borrowing powers. Now call Graeme Simpson. Thank you. The answer that Bruce Crawford was looking for was £100 million, by the way. Um, my question uh, relates to the route map that the First Minister has just outlined, um, and specifically around construction. Um, she said in phase one, uh, there would be a three-stage restart, so that's stages naught to two for construction, and that includes, I've just looked it up, um, the, the phrase soft start to site works. Um, now, does that mean, I don't know what that means, but does that mean um, that the 6,000 homes that are nearly complete in Scotland will be able to be completed? If it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? Thank you very much. Minister Kevin Stewart. Um, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. And, um, there is a huge amount of detail uh, around about the construction 
uh, restart and the agreements that we have made around about safe operating procedures uh, and that phased approach uh, to restart. Um, and I will uh, send all of the detail uh, on that to Mr. Simpson because I'm not going to be able to fit all of that into uh, this answer. Um, what the First Minister outlined today is that phased approach. Um, the, working together with the construction industry, uh, we have put together uh, a six-phased approach. Um, uh, and the first stages um, that the First Minister outlined today uh, were mainly ensuring uh, getting sites into shape to allow for physical distancing and for the hygiene that's necessary um, to, to move forward. Uh, and we will move forward incrementally at each stage uh, as we progress. And of course, uh, we will work with the industry, with trade unions and others to make sure that that phased approach um, is working safely. Um, I would very much like to thank um, the construction industry, um, trade unions and others who have worked with us um, uh, in terms of shaping uh, how we move forward. And I'm sure um, that we will all work in partnership together to ensure that the returns and those phases uh, uh, ensure that people are, are safe in their work. Graham Simpson. Um, thank, uh, thank you for that answer. And I really will appreciate the, the details that the, the, the ministers promised. Can he ensure that when, when construction does restart, that there is alignment with supply chains? Because obviously there's no point getting back on site if you can't get things like, you know, windows and doors and stuff like that. Kevin Stewart. Uh, President officer, that is something um, that I'm very well aware of in terms of my discussion uh, with industry. And in terms of the safe operating procedures, um, uh, uh, as I've outlined, uh, what we have tried to do there um, in the last number of weeks is look at supply chain delivery um, into sites and to make sure um, that that um, is done appropriately and as safely as possible as well. Um, I have to say to the Chamber um, that we continue to refine uh, with the construction industry and with trade unions um, these safe operating procedures and this phased approach. Um, and that will continue, so there will be refinement as we uh, move along uh, uh, as well. Um, and as I said, uh, my thanks go to everyone who has been involved in this uh, because it has been uh, a really good piece of work, uh, but everyone is aware that in order to make that uh, return, uh, we have to do it safely to protect people. Thank you very much. Before I call the next question, and I should mention that Finance Secretary Kay Forbes is also uh, online uh, to answer any questions that are specific to her responsibilities. I now call Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting local authorities to maintain vital and increased services for communities resulting from the COVID-19 outbreak. Eileen Campbell. I continue to have regular engagement with uh, COSLA uh, and SOLIS uh, to make sure that they can uh, let us know if there are any challenges that they face, but also uh, in terms of the, the ongoing dialogue to respond to the pandemic. Uh, I have, uh, in March, we announced the £350 to ha million pounds to support communities uh, and to support the third sector and to support local government in order to them to respond and support communities who are most impacted by the impacts of the pandemic. And with ongoing discussion with local authorities, as I mentioned in my uh, answer to Bruce uh, Crawford, COSLA have provided the financial analysis of the pressures that they're facing and will continue to engage with uh, COSLA on that to look to see how can we, we can support one another to help ensure that services remain and continue and that they're aligned to the, uh, the route map that the First Minister published uh, earlier today. Thank you very much. A supplementary, Sarah Barr. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and say, um, I understand from my own local council in Edinburgh that funding from the Scottish Government has been slow to arrive, which means that they are 70% short on spending up to the end of June at a time when their income loss is huge for issues such as parking or alio income. When are they actually going to receive the support they, they need to keep those vital services going? And are they having to rely on res reserves Meantime, until the Scottish Government gets that money out to them that they urgently need. 
Government Secretary. Well, in addition to the funding that we've outlined, uh, for instance, within that £350 million package of support that I mentioned that I had announced in March, £50 million of, of that went straight to local authorities. And in addition to the consequentials that have been uh, discussed, we've also agreed flexibility within uh, local government. So we've replaced uh, 972 million of lost non-domestic rates income with additional grant revenue grant of the same amount. Um, uh, following an agreement with COSLA, we're front loading the normal weekly grant payments by 150 million in May, 100 million in June, and 50 million in July to ease local authority cash flow problems. And we've agreed uh, to, real, to a relaxation of some ring fence budgets to enable greater flexibility in local authority responses. So in addition to the actual consequentials that we're talking about and we're uh, passing to, to local government, we've also uh, agreed a, a package of significant measures to enable local authorities to have that uh, ease uh, and reassurance that their, their cash flow problems can be uh, supported through those flexibilities and those agreements. Call Andy White. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, yesterday, Pauline McNeill highlighted uh, in the debate um, that uh, research across the UK had revealed six out of ten renters were suffering financially uh, and that one in five had been forced to choose between food uh, and rent. M in response, Mr Stewart said, and I quote, I assure Ms McNeill and Parliament here and now that we will, as we begin to gather evidence and data on what is going on out there in real folks' lives, be more than willing to share the data with Parliament. Can I ask the Minister, when will this... Uh, evidence and data gathering a start and when will it be reported to Parliament? Kevin Stewart. Um, President Officer, thank you very much. First of all, um, I'd like to uh, apologise unreservedly to uh, Mr Whiteman uh, for my intemperate um, remarks and behaviour yesterday um, and I will write to him um, uh, with that written apology. Um, I think that uh, in the heat of the moment, um, I went too far and I do apologise unreservedly uh, to Mr Whiteman and I do want to make sure uh, that we can work across uh, the Parliament and the Chamber in future to get these things right. Um, in terms of my remarks yesterday um, to Ms McNeil, um, as I said to her, as we gather data uh, and what is going on out there, uh, we are more than willing to share all of that um, with colleagues uh, across the Chamber uh, in order um, that we can all look to see exactly what the impacts of COVID-19 uh, have been. Um, I think we are still at the early stages um, in terms of uh, not being able to understand all of the impacts um, that have taken place uh, across society. Uh, I mean, it is absolutely vital um, that we uh, look at analysis um, as that comes in. Uh, and for uh, an example, um, we have got some work going on at this moment in time, uh, which will be a small uh, amount of data collection and analysis to look at um, how uh, uh, fuel poverty um, has been affected by COVID-19. Uh, and uh, as I've said, we are more than willing to share that as, uh, as we get it. Andy White. I thank the Minister for his answer. I also thank him for his uh, apology, which is uh, um, accepted in, in good faith. And I look forward to working with him on these important matters. My, my, my question was specifically on the evidence and data around the financial difficulties that renters are facing. And the answer implied that a specific exercise was going to be underway uh, on that. And just to confirm, that's what I'm interested in. I, I presume also from his answer yesterday that no data at the moment is collected on the financial difficulty uh, faced by tenants. I could welcome that c confirmation or otherwise. Kevin Stewart. Um, we will uh, enhance um, data collection as we move forward without a doubt. Um, but uh, again, I'm very grateful um, uh, to, to colleagues um, in housing associations and in councils in particular um, who are carrying out their own work at this moment in time uh, to look at and see the impact uh, on tenants um, in the social sector. Uh, I think that we have got uh, a little bit further to go in terms of data collection um, in the private rented sector, uh, but we have to do that as we move forward uh, to look at all of the impacts um, right uh, across the board. Um, and as we uh, receive um, robust data, um, I will share that with Parliament uh, so that everybody is aware uh, of the impacts that COVID-19 uh, has had in uh, some of our most vulnerable folk. Thank you very much. We now have a series of questioners who are not present in the Parliament, so can I remind questioners, without the benefit of eye contact, please to press your button if you do uh, request a supplementary. Uh, Liam MacArthur. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer, and can I belatedly welcome you to your uh, post. I wasn't present when you first uh, took it up. Uh, to ask the Finance Secretary uh, whether local authorities can expect the full £155 million of consequentials, and if so, when? Finance Secretary Kate Forbes. Answer? I don't think I can be seen. I thank, the, I thank the member for that uh, question. And the short answer is yes, they can expect the full £155 million on top of the money that we've already provided to local government, which takes the total we are uh, providing to local government in additional funding of £300 million. And we will agree with COSLA how that is distributed. I recently received um, communication from COSLA on that point around distribution distribution and will ensure that they get that money as quickly as possible. Another uh, remote questioner is Annabel Ewing. I call Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I ask the Minister Kevin Stewart uh, if he will provide an update on what the Scottish Government is doing to support tenants in need further to the coronavirus crisis? Kevin Stewart. Um, I thank the member for her question, uh, presiding officer. Um, as uh, we have outlined, uh, as I outlined yesterday, um, the government uh, has provided £350 million uh, of funding for those uh, in need uh, to cover all aspects uh, of difficulties that um, people may be having uh, in their lives at this moment. Uh, the key thing in terms of uh, renters um, is that if they are in difficulty, um, first of all, they should contact their landlord uh, to see what help uh, can be provided to them uh, to ensure um, that they are accessing um, universal credit or housing benefit um, if that is uh, what is required. Um, beyond that, I know that uh, landlords, particularly in the social sector, but also in the private rented sector, um, are uh, having uh, discussions with uh, uh, tenants around about how to uh, manage rent, and in some cases, uh, rents have gone down. Um, as the member is probably aware, uh, we also announced yesterday uh, an additional £5 million uh, for discretionary housing payments um, for those folks who are uh, facing severe financial pressure um, to access. Uh, what we have also done um, is ask the UK government uh, to continue um, uh, uh, with uh, the changes that they have made to local housing allowances, um, which have been put in as a temporary measure, um, and we'll continue to talk to the UK government around about how um, uh, uh, they should look to uh, changing their current welfare reforms, which of course also have a major impact on renters and those most vulnerable. Annabelle Ewing. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer and I very much welcome the support that the Scottish Government is making available, including the uh, additional £5 million announced yesterday for the discretionary housing payment. Uh, I, I, my concern would be to ensure that all tenants in need were aware of the help that uh, they would be entitled to. And I wonder if the Minister is satisfied that there is sufficient signposting to ensure that that information is widely uh, available. Kevin um, I, I thank Ms Ewing for that question. Um, when we announced the um, uh, no eviction uh, uh, policy and moved that legislation forward, uh, we at that point mounted um, a campaign, uh, mainly on social media, uh, but also in other places, uh, to uh, highlight to tenants uh, what uh, they should do uh, and what their rights uh, were. Uh, we have also um, uh, provided money uh, to Citizens Advice Scotland uh, in order for them uh, to help tenants who are most in need. Um, the first campaign uh, reached uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands actually, of people um, uh, throughout the country. Uh, it may well be that we have to uh, run that campaign again um, or uh, alternatively um, uh, look to um, uh, those in the uh, social uh, sector and the private rented sector to make their tenants uh, aware of what um, their rights uh, actually are. Uh, I will reflect on what Ms Ewing has said around about um, uh, a, a further 
um, uh, programme of work to, to, to highlight these things. Uh, but the key thing in all of this is if folks are in difficulties, contact your landlord, please. And I call Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. And can I ask the uh, Cabinet Secretary, as she'll be aware, registrars are now going to be issuing wedding certificates um, for, so people can get married. However, places of worship are still closed and most venues and hotels are closed. Under the First Minister's announcement, when is it, uh, in her view, likely that weddings will be able to take place either in a place of worship or in a hotel or other venue? Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Well, in many respects, it's very difficult to give a definitive date about when these things can start to happen. But I think what's, what's clear is that the, what's motivating the decisions and the sequencing of the decisions is by making a balanced uh, judgment on the evidence that presents itself and the continued efforts to suppress the uh, spread of the, of the virus. So it's a very difficult, delicate balance uh, and one that we have, I think, articulated within the, the document that's been published today that enables us to think ahead about when we might be able to get to a, place, a, a position where we can open places of worship and when other businesses might be able to open uh, as well. And actually, how do you configure some of these uh, family gatherings in a way that can be done uh, safely? So while there is no uh, comfort necessarily and no, and no date, a definitive date, I think it's we're absolutely aware of the, the, the need to give people a bit of certainty, to give people uh, an understanding of when they can start to plan some of these things. But what has to govern all these decisions is the need to suppress the, the spread of the pandemic, making sure that, as the First Minister said, that there are no bridges by which the, 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 the disease, disease can spread. And we've worked and continue to work and engage with our uh, uh, faith groups and, and churches in order to ensure that they can get an understanding of when, what might they need to do to ensure that their congregations, if they, when they do start to, to come back to their places of worship, can do that safely. And that's why we've also engaged with uh, our faith groups in order to try and find other ways and support other ways for, by which people can observe their faith uh, and feel that connection, which is so important, particularly when people are, are in uh, lockdown restrictions. So uh, we'll continue to keep the member uh, informed and the population more generally informed of, uh, of these things. But I think what we have to make sure is that we're governed by the evidence, the information, uh, and make sure that we make a balanced uh, judgment going forward Forward and that we continue to, to work with the groups that have an interest in weddings and other uh, celebrations. Jeremy Barfer. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer? I, I'm sure she's aware that weddings and other forms of uh, public worship vary in size and um, type of service. Will there, not, will there be a, a different a standard for smaller weddings compared to larger weddings? Um, and will there be uh, different ways that churches and other places of worship can open depending on the number of people that attend that venue? Aileen Campbell. Uh, again, we're kind of continuing to engage with our, our uh, faith groups. You know, at the start of this pandemic, I did uh, endeavour to call as many of our faith leaders as possible because we knew it was going to have a real impact on um, the observance of faith and also because at this point in time when people are feeling isolated and uh, removed from their family that often they will be looking to their faith to find some uh, to find some support and that in itself that physical ability to do that is no longer there so we have been engaged with our faith groups to make sure that what we can do is move forward safely that is uh, is listed within the the document that's been published today but we have to be careful that we don't put people under any uh, increase risk and that's what, again why we're working through these things and we'll continue to work with our faith leaders in order that they can put in place some of the measures that are necessary to, in order to for gatherings to happen safely and that's not going to happen eh, anytime soon at the moment the first minister talked this morning this afternoon sorry about the very gradual eh, easing of restrictions and at that point in time when we're able to do that more generally and eh, with our faith groups then we'll continue to work with them in order to do so and to do so safely eh, and we'll continue to do that and keep the member informed and others informed as how as that thinking progresses thank you very much i now call emma harper thank you presiding officer Many local food and drink businesses are diversifying to meet the challenges presented by COVID-19. And some of these businesses want to expand to outdoor spaces to meet social distancing requirements when it's safe to do so. And many continue to offer home deliveries uh, of food and alcohol, which require licenses. So can I ask the Scottish Government, therefore, to outline whether any of these licensing requirements 
will have or will be altered potentially and whether it can can the government provide any advice for businesses in this situation minister kevin stewart thank you president officer the government responded uh, quickly to the coronavirus outbreak by adding new discretion and flexibility uh, into the licensing system uh, with provision in the first coronavirus scotland act um, and uh, these changes were warmly welcomed by those in the licensed trade and other licensing stakeholders. Uh, it is, however, um, very important to acknowledge that uh, a licensing regime for the sale of alcohol um, exists for a reason. Uh, and as the member will be aware, um, Scotland has uh, a challenging relationship with alcohol. Uh, and given the dangers of alcohol misuse, uh, it wouldn't be right to simply uh, sweep away the need for uh, licensing uh, the sale of alcohol. Uh, that having been said, um, licensing should never be seen as a barrier uh, to those who wish to sell alcohol. The government expects all 32 licensing boards to have the interests of their communities um, at the heart, uh, including uh, economic interests of, of license holders by ensuring that the licensing regime is operating as fully as possible uh, to aid the recovery from the coronavirus outbreak. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I think I, I won't pursue any supplementary at this point because I'll need to go back to my constituents and find out some further information from them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Tom Mason. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I remind colleagues I am a councillor in, in Aberdeen. A vital element of moving forward from the current pandemic is getting construction sites back to build more houses. And I'm glad the First Minister made reference to this earlier this afternoon. There have been successes, like in Aberdeen, where the current administration, in the face of severe budget cuts, is on target to build 10 times as many houses by 2022 as the previous administration did between 2007 and 2012. Will the Minister commend this progress and pledge to work with local authorities to make sure they have the support required post-COVID to deliver the housing this country needs? Thank you. Minister Kevin Stewart. Um, uh, President officer, um, uh, we were on track to deliver 50,000 affordable homes, including 35,000 for social rent uh, before um, coronavirus came into play. Um, and uh, while uh, we're not going to reach that target, it is my uh, ambition uh, and the uh, ambition of the government uh, to ensure that we deliver as many homes uh, during the course of this parliamentary term um, as possible. Uh, I have to say that in order for us to uh, meet the challenge that we set ourselves, uh, the government have been reliant on partners and local authorities, uh, housing associations, uh, the construction sector, uh, and many, many more. And I know that uh, many folks uh, have put their heart and soul uh, into delivering uh, what was an ambitious uh, housing program uh, and that they, uh, like me, um, are, are, are sorry that we have uh, the situation uh, that we find ourselves in. Um, what I can say to Mr. Mason uh, and to those folks uh, across the country um, is that as we move out uh, of this, as uh, we uh, relax um, uh, the, the lockdown, we will continue as a government to work in partnership with everyone to deliver as many affordable homes as possible because that's what we need here in our country. I now call Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. Um, can I raise the issue of councils and social landlords not actually allocating houses? The, I, I contacted the head of housing in Fife recently and he wrote back to me saying, you know the advice from the government is that people should not be moving house at this time. That's why the council has suspended normal housing allocations. We're making efforts to allocate property to homeless households, but this is at a much reduced rate than normal. When are we going to start to see the government working with local authorities start allocating houses? Because that's crucial. And you know, I remind the minister, we were in a housing crisis before COVID came along. So 
you know, we need to get house and moving again. Is he working with councils to get that to happen? Kevin Stewart. Um, President officer, I am uh, working very closely um, with uh, local authorities and um, uh, housing associations in order that we get all of this absolutely right. Uh, and Mr. Rowley uh, mentioned the head of housing in Fife, John Mills, who is also um, the lead in Alacho um, at this moment in time. And uh, John uh, is very much involved in the resilience group, which is led by the SFHA, uh, around about how uh, we move forward on this front. Mr. Rowley is right to point out that at this moment, um, what we have is a situation where um, uh, there are allocations being made to homeless folks uh, and I am very uh, keen to ensure um, that we uh, um, can move uh, folks who have been um, in unsuitable accommodation or in some cases um, even on the streets uh, into housing. Uh, we have also put in place um, with the local authorities and housing associations um, allocation plans for those uh, women in particular who have faced uh, domestic abuse in order uh, to get that absolutely right. Um, Mr Rowley um, is a knowledgeable man and is uh, aware uh, that in some regards um, there are sometimes difficulties in allocations uh, without having the right repairs uh, and that has caused uh, some grief as well uh, and we are working our way through that um, in order uh, to get that right. Um, as the First Minister laid out today, we will have a phased approach uh, in terms of uh, that return. Um, that, the allocation of housing is something that we are very aware of uh, and we will continue to look uh, to see uh, uh, when the, the right time is for a full uh, return to allocations as was. Alec Riley. Yeah, I mean, I honestly don't believe that's good enough. We have to start to get the house and moving the crisis that's in house. And so there are there are people who have been told that they've been given their tenancy. There are people who are massively overcrowded. There are people who are in unsuitable housing. We have to get this moving. Otherwise, all you're doing is stoking up the housing crisis even more. So I would ask the minister, the first minister today said that how sales, etc., will come in phase two. I don't believe we can wait to phase two to start seeing councils allocating houses again. So will he give this priority and start to see how we can move this fairly quickly? Governor Stewart. I understand uh, Mr Riley's uh, frustration in all of this, but uh, I think he will understand that in all of this we are dictated to um, by the virus. If I could maybe add to what I've said previously um, around about getting this right. Um, there have been discussions, for example, uh, around about how viewings can take place um, without, without um, you know, the normal circumstance of someone going in with the keys and showing folk around the house. Um, and I know that the sector as a whole are looking at alternatives uh, to the ways of working uh, that we had previously. But we have to ensure that we get all of this absolutely right. And that is why um, I am um, sweared uh, to give Mr Rowley uh, a timescale at this moment. I recognise um, the difficulties that are out there. Like everyone else in the chamber, I have got constituents who want to make a move. But we have to do this uh, at the right time. Uh, and, you know, we will continue uh, to keep the chamber up to date uh, around about how we can move forward in that front uh, and the work that we're doing with partners uh, in order to get that right. I now call Gail Ross. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government what can be done to support local government employees who are coming to the end of fixed term contracts? and will be ineligible for continued furlough after the 1st of July. Uh, Finance Secretary Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, as Gail Ross will know, it's a, an important issue that she raises, 
employment terms and conditions are obviously a, a matter for local government, but uh, I would hope that in cases like that, the local authority would give serious consideration to what further support they can offer to ensure continuity of employment. Clearly, some of the, the challenges in our communities uh, and um, that are causing local government to be on the front line and providing support will require ongoing staffing support. So I'd be very happy to uh, work with COSLA and to raise this with COSLA uh, the next time I discuss it. Gail Ross. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Would she agree with me that given that a lot of these posts are in vital sectors such as care and learning, shouldn't the local authorities be encouraging more people into these sectors at this time? Kate Forbes. Absolutely. So we've seen, even with the publication today of the route map out of the, this um, pandemic, that there is going to be a change in need in terms of staffing support, in terms of areas of importance for local authorities, and particularly as uh, children start to return to school, there's going to be a, a need for additional staffing to support, for example, social distancing within our schools. So uh, again, I'd be very happy to raise those matters with COSLA the next time I discuss um, areas like this with them. Thank you very much. I now call Edward Mountain. In the absence of Mr. Mountain, for the moment at least, uh, is, is a perfect opportunity for a delayed supplementary from Liam MacArthur to Kate Forbes. Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, very happy to step back into the breach there. Um, I would welcome a response from the Finance Secretary to the issue um, of many tourism businesses unable to access any support uh, because they don't have a specific business bank account. I know that she's been considering whether or not uh, local authorities might be able to manage a fund that might be able to uh, target uh, funding at those businesses and would welcome an update of those discussions. Kate Forbes. I think the first thing to say is that I'm very mindful of the issue that Liam MacArthur raises. Obviously, I've got a lot of tourism businesses in my own constituency, uh, and many of them don't have uh, business bank accounts. And they are one of a number of different groups that as yet haven't been able to access support. There are, there are others. Yesterday, it was raised the point around market traders, for example, that haven't been able to get help through the non-domestic rate system. So, you know, my, my approach throughout this has been to provide funding and when criticisms have been made or when suggestions have been made for how to improve it, to then go away and see if we can tweak systems or um, provide additional funding. Now, the, the hardship scheme, the Pivotal um, Enterprise Resilience Fund, have now uh, closed with additional funding being announced yesterday. But I am very keen that some of those groups, one of which he has mentioned just there in terms of business bank accounts, do get help. I would strongly suggest this isn't the end of the story and we will work night and day to get further uh, support in place. Thank you very much. I now call Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. Um, while schools are closed, local authorities are still delivering the free school meals programme, often providing direct payments. The current funding allocation does not meet the cost of delivery and many authorities are seeing an increase in uptake. I understand that local authorities were awarded support from the Food Fund, but that is stretched thin across a number of projects. As we approach the summer holidays, will local authorities be funded to continue the free school meal provision throughout July and August to support families? And can the Cabinet Secretary say how much of the 70 million Food Fund has been allocated? Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Claire Baker asks ask a really important uh, 
question. The, we gave out the 70 million uh, food fund, we gave 15 million to local authorities to cover the free school meals, 50 million pounds for their other food insecurity issues that they may want to cover. So that was a 30 million pot. Uh, 30 million was uh, earmarked out the 70 million for the shielded group. Uh, and 10 million has been used and continues to be used to respond to other uh, issues of food insecurity. So for instance, the awarding of funding to Fair Share, Social Bite, other groups and organisations that are delivering for very vulnerable and marginalised uh, uh, people. But um, yeah, it, was, it, run, it lasts up until June. So that again will then mean that we'll need to start engaging again on the issue around how, and how we support families over the summer holidays. Now, that's going to be a challenge. It will be a challenge, I'm being quite upfront, because there are more now people on universal credit and we're going to need to kind of continue to make sure that the food insecurity issue doesn't drop off our radar because there are more people on universal credit. There'll be more families uh, requiring support over those, uh, those summer months and there'll be more people more generally having their finances stretched. So uh, we'll continue to engage with local authorities. I'll continue to have good discussions with uh, my cabinet colleagues on, on these issues. And there'll be other issues around that test, trace and isolate as well if people are having to kind of stay at home for longer over the course of the year eh, as well. So there's a whole gambit of issues around food insecurity that we're having to think through. Eh, but what I will say is that there eh, is good work happening in the communities. There are lots of organisations and groups that are providing support and there are, for by the food fund, there have been awards of uh, support to local organisations through the community uh, support and communities fund and the wellbeing fund, which are delivering food uh, in, in security projects across uh, across the country. So it's not just the 70 million that's delivering uh, support for food; uh, it's uh, the whole 350 million, which is su su supporting uh, hard-pressed families. And that is also should be viewed in addition to the doubling of the Scottish Welfare Fund eh, as well, which is a crucial eh, bit of financial assistance to families. And that again, look, links back to our cash first approach so that families have the autonomy and the agency to make their own decisions along with the dignity that, that eh, goes with it. Thank you. Uh, Claire Baker. Thank the Cabinet Secretary very much for that response. And she will recognise that a lot of the local authorities are providing the school meals provision at the moment as a direct payment, which on average is about £10 a week, which is a cash first policy. So I hope that she would recognise there were local authorities last summer, including Fife, who did run their own um, school meals project over the summers and how valuable that was. And that some additional money could be found. It will only, it'll be a shorter summer break this time, so we're talking about six weeks, five and a half weeks, to provide that additional support to these families. Aileen Campbell. Absolutely, and those engagement, that engagement will, 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 will con continue, and uh, it's something that we know, and I've visited Fife, I've visited a number of uh, uh, council authority areas over the summer holidays, and other holiday times as well, when it's particularly uh, a challenging for families where their resources are stretched. But again, that is why we very quickly and swiftly moved to making sure that we provided financial support to communities, to local authority, to the third sector. It's why we doubled the Scottish Welfare Fund. It's why we've issued guidance to local authorities to make sure that they take that cash first approach. Um, uh, and is why we continue to think about how do we now move into a different phase of how we provide support around food when the restrictions start to ease up uh, and how we then best use the resources to uh, along with local authorities to try and protect uh, families that require uh, that support and continue uh, to have need. Call Joan McAlpine. Thank you. I have been approached by a church hall in my constituency region who expected to benefit from the extension of the small business grant to charities. However, the church hall in question has been refused the grant by the council because the relief they receive is church exemption rather than charity relief. This is despite church halls being included in the list of premises which passed the relief test in Cape Forbes circular to councils on the 30th of March. Is this an anomaly that the government is aware of? And if so, how can it be addressed? Cabinet Secretary Kate Forbes. Member for that question, it does sound quite a strange one. I'd appreciate perhaps further information. I'll, I'll, I'll look into it with the local authority. I mean, our commitment just now is to try and provide as much support to charities as possible, and that includes churches. And that's why we extended the small business grant to include those that were eligible for charitable relief rather than the small business bonus and back that up with £30 million. And of course, there's also the Third Sector Resilience Fund. But clearly, Joan McAlpine's question comes from a place in which uh, a church hall has not received 
funding. So whilst I continue to review the support measures that are in place to ensure we're doing everything we can to provide support, uh, I, I became to look into precisely what that anomaly is, because we have tried to fix as many of the anomalies as possible that emerge. John McAlpern. I thank the Cabinet Secretary very much for that answer. It's the Freeson Galloway Council, and I shall certainly be writing to her, and I would very much appreciate if she could take it up with the Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. And time for a brief supplementary from Neil Findlay. May un make understand what is uh, happening in relation to delayed discharge. Um, we've had record delayed discharge uh, prior to the COVID crisis. And then moving on from that, we had a thousand people being uh, discharged into care homes and council services in March. Trying to understand where the capacity came from for these people to go to. Was the capacity always there? or was the capacity found through additional money? Cabinet Secretary Elaine Campbell. Uh, and I understand that it's appropriate to kind of raise these issues when you get the chance. I think some of the detail, I'll make sure that you get the, the responses that you require from if they've not been answered already by the uh, First Minister or the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health. But again, you know, going back to the, 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 the decisions and the rationale, it was to try and ensure that we could make sure that the NHS wasn't uh, overwhelmed by uh, the, the virus and also making sure that they was get, those decisions were guided by the best advice that was possible. But again, some of this is not necessarily sitting within my portfolio, but I make sure that we'll engage and endeavour to make sure that the Neil Finlay gets the, the responses that he wants if he feels that they haven't been answered in the times that he's asked them uh, in the past. Thank you very much. I hope that that allows us now to take and I call Edward Mountain for the final question of the session. Edward Martin. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to turn to a point that was raised by Liam MacArthur and something that I've raised before in this chamber, and that is the issue of business bank accounts and why small businesses don't need them. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance will, rem will remember I raised it with her. I raised it with the First Minister who agreed that she would ask the Cabinet Secretary to look at it. And after that, you wrote to me, Cabinet Secretary, saying that there was no way that you would change it. Now, small businesses are advised not to have business bank accounts by their banks. HMRC don't require them to do it. And now they have been left out in the cold. They need more help than just an assurance you're going to tweak it. Will you give it? Will you give them an assurance today that you're going to help them because they've been left out? Cabinet Secretary Kate Forbes. My assurance is to every business to look at how we can help them. In relation to the point that Edward Mountain has raised, he'll know from my letter that I was very clear that when it comes to our schemes, we have got to balance the challenges around fraud, as well as ensuring that the hurdles that small businesses have to leap over in order to get support are as minimal as possible. In relation to the Creative Fund, the Creative Fund was looking to quantify hardship. It was looking to understand the need, as well as to ensure that the money was going to genuine businesses. I recognise that with a large group of different businesses, from photographers all the way through to B&Bs, it's very difficult to get eligibility criteria that works for everybody. And that's why I said to Liam MacArthur that I'm very aware because probably the same constituents writing to him are writing to me. So I'm very aware of the uh, groups that still have not had support. That includes market traders. It includes b and with business, without business bank accounts and a number of others. And so obviously the work to try and get support to these groups has not stopped. I will continue to do that. And I will continue to make sure that the eligibility criteria is such that it does not exclude people for without having good reason to do so. And finally, a supplementary question from Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In your letter, Cabinet Secretary, you said the reason why you put the big business bank account requirement in was to prevent fraud. Well, it's not a requirement that HMRC require for those businesses to pay tax. In fact, they're very happy to accept the tax from them but you're not happy to give them the grant because they don't have that bank account. 
I urge you again, Cabinet Secretary, you need to do more than just offer a tweet. They are feeling really hurt, and I would urge you to help them. Kate Forbes. I recognise that they need support, but I would also encourage Edward Mountain to recognise and understand the fact that in providing these um, forms of support, it is not good enough to just say that uh, there is no eligibility criteria. We have to get the right eligibility criteria. But to talk about HMRC demonstrates my point. These schemes are not based on the tax system because HMRC is reserved to the UK government. Now, if the UK government wants to establish a scheme linked to HMRC, that would probably allow money to go out faster. I'm not going to wait for the UK government to do that. I want to get support to those businesses. I will ensure that as many businesses get support as possible. We've got to do that in a wise way that manages our public finances. And I recognise the hardship. So I commend Edward Mountain for raising the issue. It's not the first time he's raised the issue. We will try and get support to them, but we have got to do that in a sensible way that prudently manages our public funding to ensure it goes to the businesses that need it. Thank you very much, colleagues. That concludes the members' question time session on local government and communities. We'll now suspend for a few moments before moving on to the next item of business. Thank you.